Hey everyone, welcome to the Energon Universe discussion video for Duke number four, the penultimate issue for the Energon Universe's first G.I. Joe title. There's a lot of intriguing details in this issue, stuff that's got me wondering about implications for issue number five, as well as potential ramifications for the new G.I. Joe series to follow, so let's get into it. As should be expected, this issue picks up in the immediate aftermath of Duke number three, with Major Blood and his bloodhounds storming the pit to kill Duke at the behest of Destro. Outnumbered, Duke chooses to release Baroness, a decision that seems to quickly backfire on the real American hero as Baroness shoots blood in the head and then turns her weapon towards Duke, intent on taking the bounty on Duke's head for herself. Duke is able to turn the situation around by convincing Baroness that the people hunting him aren't going to stop with just killing him. He argues that they would be unlikely to leave any loose ends, including the Baroness. This ploy works, and the ragtag group consisting of Duke, Clutch, Stalker, Rock and Roll, and the Baroness make use of the vehicles stored in the pit to stage their escape. We've seen plenty of notable Joe vehicles referenced already with the Weapons Lab at Mars Industries in issue number one, and the Vamp in issue number two, and the tradition continues here with the Sky Striker, Mobat, APC, as well as the Bloodhounds, Fang, Copters. Vehicles are a fairly major component of the G. G.I. Joe brand, so their inclusion in this issue not only makes sense, but really contributes to the rummaging through the toy box feel that adds a layer of fun to the mix. And maybe it's just me, but it seems like they're used to a more substantial effect here with previous vehicles being relegated to just being part of the background or seeing a minimal use. But the usage of vehicles in this issue is also in service of moving the plot forward. Duke uses the confiscated Sky Striker to head towards the location stored in the device Dr. Burkhardt gave him back in the first issue. This leads to a cool moment with the introduction of Scrap Iron, the Cobra anti-armor specialist from the original toy line. Scrap Iron is a logical addition to Mars as the character's file card specifically ties him to Destro, stating that he's a product designer for Destro's armaments company. This sequence is another instance of the creative team playing with the toys to great effect. The original Scrap Iron toy was packaged with a remote-controlled anti-tank missile launcher accessory and that is part and parcel of the character's first appearance here as he uses it to shoot down Duke's Sky Striker. Like some of the other characters we've seen so far, Scrap Iron is based on his classified figure, with the scars on his face and the updated missile drone being the real giveaways. And this part is likely unintentional, but I can't help but notice that Scrap Iron's actions here continue on a tradition from the Marvel Comics days, where the character, who is explicitly called out as making use of an anti-tank missile, missile system in his file card doesn't actually use his specialty on a tank. I don't know why that is, but maybe someday he'll get to use his characteristic accessory as it was intended. This sequence with Scrap Iron is my favorite part of the issue, as there's just something about this one-on-one -on -one confrontation that appeals to me. Although it's a brief sequence, the action here feels a bit more fleshed out and interesting to me compared to the chaos and bustle during the siege at the pit. I love the colors during this segment as well, with predominantly cool tones punctuated by warmer ones, and I'm a big fan of this panel with the streaks of color applied to the Sky Striker, as well as the usage of this nice off-white color, which looks really good set against this blue background, used to emphasize and enhance the dramatic effect of the motion lines. The whole thing culminates in this bit where the Sky Striker crashes with this understated use of lettering with a nice looking color gradient. This part plays into that whole pop art aesthetic that I'm continuously bringing up in my cover in the series. I don't know if that's the best comparison to make because I usually expect more bold colors with pop art and this seems a lot more subdued. I don't know, whatever it is, I think this element is a big part of the visual identity of the book. So I'm always happy to see how it's implemented into each issue because it tends to be something different each time. And I really appreciate that about this series. But Duke number four has plenty of other interesting moments as well, some with more far reaching implications than others. They didn't make us wait long to confirm that Blood survived his gunshot wound to the head. As expected, this serves as an explanation for how the character lost his eye, as well as creating some bad blood, if you will, between Major Blood and the Baroness. This is on a similar wavelength as what's happening with Cobra Commander and the Dreadnoughts in the Cobra Commander series, and I really like the setup where one day, when all of these folks wind up as part of Cobra, there will be plenty of seeds planted for some tense and bitter alliances that could easily fall 
prey to betrayal and infighting. There's also plenty of noteworthy tidbits on the Mars Industries side of things, even beyond this sweet red suit that Destro is wearing. We see another weapons site, this time at the location where Dr. Burkhardt's device pointed Duke towards her stolen tech, which I'm thinking must be part of this fancy generator that Duke calls a massive battery. Maybe this thing taps into the power source that Burkhardt mentioned in the first issue? I kind of thought she was talking about Energon there, but now I'm not so sure. The way this sequence is presented to the reader, with Duke wondering what the generator is powering, then cutting to the torso of a bat or battle android trooper as it lights up, that's got me wondering if Destro is using the device to power the bat, which might explain why there's just the one. I mean, maybe even with that humongous generator, they still don't have enough power to operate more than one bat at a time. Remember, one of Destro's technicians says that a lot of their tech is going to require a stronger power source to be viable in the field. So it's not impossible, and this is maybe the creators giving us a hint as to how Energon is eventually going to fit into Destro's operation and provide him with the means to realize the full scale of his ambitions. It might also be foreshadowing for how Duke is going to prevail here. I'm not sure, but I'm hoping we get some confidence concrete answers on this stuff next issue. We know that Energon will be helping Destro at some point based on the solicit information for the first issue of the Destro series, so we'll have to see. I also want to talk about the Baroness, who remains an enigma to me. If you remember, prior to the series launch, promotional material from Skybound generated some buzz because Baroness was standing next to Duke, Stalker, and Hawk as part of the roster for G.I. Joe, or at the very least, the roster of heroes. And while the cliffhanger from issue three made that prospect seem unlikely, Likely, things do turn around again in this issue, and Baroness does forge a very temporary alliance with Duke. And as an aside, I found it amusing that due to his injuries, Duke is down on one knee while he makes his proposal of an alliance to Baroness. I'm sure it was unintentional, but I always get a little kick out of ironic coincidences like these. Anyway, the point is, I can't help but wonder if the brief team-up in this issue is really going to be as far as that angle goes. It's possible. Maybe this was just a little bit of marketing that served its purpose, getting people interested in and curious about the series, but I really hope that it signals something more. At the very least, I hope that it means Skybound is willing to consider doing some unexpected things with the character. I mean, I certainly didn't walk away from this issue thinking that Baroness was going straight into the arms of Cobra. I wouldn't be surprised if that's where she winds up eventually, but I'm really getting the sense that this version of Baroness is all about Baroness, first and foremost. She seems to be set up as a free agent here, and my hope is that Skybound puts that to good use. There's a lot of room there for unexpected character development, shifting allegiances, and betrayal, maybe even some kind of double agent sort of situation. Whatever the plan, I think it's worth noting that in a brief span of time, this title already did quite a bit to tie Baroness to Duke, even in my opinion, pretty much suggesting that they are two sides of the same coin. Whether or not Skybound does anything with that beyond what it contributes to this book remains to be seen, but here's hoping they do. I'm also wondering if there's any chance we might see her again in issue 5. It seems unlikely that she could follow Duke in that fang, but she knows Duke is guarding a secret, an important one. So I don't know. Regardless, I think this issue also cements Duke as a pretty interesting character. He seemingly reverses his position from issue 3 on escaping from Stalker and Rock and Roll's custody, which maybe seems a bit baffling at first, but as is the case with much of the characters decisions and behavior, I think it's all explained within the text or can be inferred by the situational context. In the video for the previous issue, I pointed out that Duke was still conflicted, being pulled in different directions by his feelings of loyalty and propriety on the one hand and his frustration and drive to uncover the truth on the other. That conflicted sentiment culminates in what I now see as a pivotal moment for Duke, where the Baroness presents Duke with the observation that he's going to have to decide what he really wants with the underlying point being that what Duke really wants may not align with what he can achieve within the system. As we saw in that issue, Duke believes that he can clear his name by allowing himself to be taken in, but he also can't let his encounter with Starscream go. We see that as he reacts in a very visceral way to the suggestion that he's given up, and it seems like his conversation with the Baroness and the brief time incarcerated in the pit allowed him to come to terms with some of this stuff. In this issue, he tells the Baroness, you're afraid that 
you've gone past the point of no return, but let me tell you, it's never too late to go back. Baroness suggests that the advice is simply Duke projecting his hangups onto her, and I think she's right, but it does give us an idea of where the character is at. Duke seems to have reached a place where he knows he can't let go of his personal mission, but he still believes that there will be a way back home for him once he's seen it through. And as the poster boy for G.I. Joe, he's probably right, especially with all of the intel he's been gathering on Mars Industries. The execution and in-universe consequences are way different, but this kind of reminds me of the IDW series, with Mainframe and Snake Eyes going AWOL for a bit, but ultimately being welcomed back into the fold once they were able to prove the existence of Cobra. We'll have to wait and see if this series follows a similar trajectory or not. I'm excited to see how this series concludes. I'm expecting some surprises, but I imagine there will also be a lot left open and unresolved for future G.I. Joe comics, but we'll just have to see. Hopefully they strike a nice balance between the two. In any case, that's all I've got for Duke number four. What are your thoughts on this issue? Let me know in the comments, like, subscribe, etc. Thank you for taking the time to watch this. It's always appreciated. I hope you have a good rest of your day, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.